Okay. I am very, very happy to uh, say that we're having a, a, a bit of a mad uh, panel. I, I, uh, Daniel and I came up with this uh, sort of idea of calling it digital brutalism because um, it's all on shock and, and thrills and things like this. And so while we're, while, while he and I were trying to come up with names for something, this was like the best one. I just love this name. Anyway, and we also have great people on it. So um, the first person is who's going to speak is Adam Brown. Um, that's Adam. Because uh, I realized that you might not have known the people I was saying. The, the <laughs> second person is going to be Brendan Walker, and then of course Chris Jones. Um, and we'll do the same scenario. So once people finish. Yes. <laughs> 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 so we'll As Henry Rogers says, coming from at Bab. In with anger, out with love. <laughs> okay, can you hear me now? Okay, so now we have a fantastic panel, Digital Brutalism. Welcome, our people. To the tune of about 500 million, you <laughs> hear me now. 500 million euros um, of money of uncertain origin, which has gone into a, a project which has seen a substantial redevelopment of the centre of, of Skopje, um, along the lines of a kind of reclassicalisation or a, a false classicalisation of the city. Some of you may be aware of this project. Um, if the Macedonian authorities had chosen to uh, produce a project which would attract the attention of the world's critical architectural press, they couldn't have done better because reams and reams of papers have been written about this project um, along the lines of what have they done, you know, this kind of false kitschy version of history which they're presenting. And you can see some of the, um, the architectural styles here are obviously pastiches and kitsches of, of European architectural styles. The proliferation of, of monuments, there are about 40 statues I think of the current count of Macedonian and um, world leaders. I think Winston Churchill puts an puts um, appearance in, for some reason. Uh, but significantly, at the outset, it was, it was, um, it was criticised for not including uh, monuments to any of the uh, luminaries of the city's uh, very diverse uh, ethnic communities, the Macedonian and the Muslim communities in, in particular. Um, so... Um, that's things been addressed to some degree, and I'll tell you exactly how that's happened in a, in a minute. Um, if you want to buy some property in Bulgaria, this is a fantastic project. Uh, um, <coughs> I'm interested in these things because um, a point that Frederick raised uh, earlier on about these kind of um, the idea of digital renderings and how they resemble photographs. Um, they don't just hang there in the air. These things are produced for a very specific reason. My thesis is that the more realistic and the, the more um, photographic like they become, the more they contribute to the coming into being of the projects they depict. So there's a kind of reverse causality, a kind of reverse indexical function in these things, that 
they don't just throw money at these images willy-nilly to produce these glamorous visualizations of the city. They're there to convince, cajole, and to recruit allies to the project and to recruit, recruit finance and funding. Um, a project like this does not actually exist until the money's been pulled and the, and the project goes into construction. But um, the role of the image, of course, is, is to stimulate that. Now, economic um, reasons are only just one of the ways in which a project like this can become real because the image declares it uh, and clears the space for it to become real. In the case of Scopje, we're looking at a, uh, the idea of um, a state, the idea of a nation, and the images that are being produced are there to create this, this feeling that the state is already real and then the coming into being of it is, uh, is part of um, the whole process. But what we're looking at here are things that look like photographs. And in order to understand what we're looking at, it's very important to understand that we bring with, you know, we arrive with a certain amount of specialist knowledge. And again, keying into some of the discussions we had earlier. Uh, we know what a photograph is because we know how a camera operates. We know how the process of photography uh, takes place. We, if we didn't understand how cameras work, it would be impossible to read a photograph in the same way. And I think there's something that Barth, Barth's comments on in Camera Lucida. Um, Willem Flusser, uh, talks about the black box, and he talks about how um, photographs are to some extent um, operate in such a way as to conceal uh, the fact of their operation. But I'm, I'm not exactly sure whether I totally agree with him there, because I think in order to understand how a photograph works, you have to understand um, the camera, otherwise indexicality doesn't make sense. When you're looking at the rendering of a, of a building, you have to sim similarly understand how a photograph works and how a camera works. But then you have to understand what you're looking at there is not a photograph. So it's the opposite of semblance. It's something very different. Um, so there's a, there's a sense, especially with these kind of things, that they, they, generate, they operate in this very, very strange space which, with which you have to have a, a great deal of technical knowledge, um, tacit, naive, you know, various different levels of expert level. But um, these things are, to, to borrow a term from JavaScript, and I'm, I'm borrowing this from kind of coding language, truthy. Um, they have a kind of truthiness that they're not exactly 100% true or, or false. Um, this is a totally ungoogleable neologism here. <laughs> I'll throw that out there. That's my little bit of subversion of the blogosphere. Um, let's watch a bit of the video and I'll, I'll talk over it as, as you do. If I can get the. Uh... There's a man talking on the phone. Okay, I'll let that play and I'll, I'll just carry on with where I'm, I'm going with this. It's quite a perverse project because a lot of the things that I'm exploring and looking at uh, have since actually come into being. A lot of the projects which I'm exploring, um, I became interested in them at the stage uh, you see now, which they exist purely in the digital form. Um, a year and a half ago when I uh, really became engaged with the Scopia project, uh, the, you know, the interwebs were completely ram-jammed with these kind of images, digital uh, renderings, and so on. And now if you uh, try to find the original um, digital renderings, they're quite hard. They're buried in a layer of actual constructional photographs, um, images of completed and half-completed buildings. So the project's underway, and that whole tract of, of images which record the, the pre, you know, the prehistory of this project, uh, the image record of that has now disappeared into history. Uh, so what you're looking at here is, is a pre-visualisation of a city that now exists. So it, again, it operates in a very strange historical space. But um, absolutely fascinating collision of, uh, of styles. And in my abstract, I, I, you know, I'm calling it the 3D printed city for various reasons. I do think it's, uh, it's the case that the speed and the, and the, the, the sheer um, velocity of this development has taken a lot of people by surprise. It happened incredibly fast. The project was launched in uh, 2010. I think negotiations were obviously uh, well advanced before then, but the video that you're seeing here was, was the official launch of the project in 2010, and it's pretty much uh, <coughs> online for completion according to, to schedule, which is remarkable in any sense. And you see there's a central fountain in the city square, which is called Warrior on Horseback. Uh, is no way uh, related to Alexander the Great in any shape or form. Um, otherwise, that would be very naughty indeed. Um, the architectural critic from Macedonia uh, said they couldn't have done any better if they raised a, a monument of the Prime Minister's uh, middle finger upraised in the direction of Greece. <laughs> 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 uh, 
But uh, the, the, the best image, I think... <laughs> <laughs> the best image, of course, is the image of, of the lion, which, which uh, emerges, I think, uh, from a very, very mundane street. <coughs> and this, this colossal lion suddenly just emerges from nowhere. So I'm going to move on from that. Um, in response to the, the, the claims that they were excising various uh, ethnic cultures from the city centre, a concession was made to the Albanian community that uh, development would be considered at Skenderberg, which is the, the, the Albanian um, uh, sector of the city. Uh, but rather than re returning to this you know, idea of a multicultural, multi-ethnic and cosmopolitan city, the response is to create more statues of different ethnic groups. So again, these kind of things just proliferate. Um, and there's a, there's a fantastic 3D fly-through of this, which I'm not going to um, bore you with. You can look at that in, in your own time. But I'm interested in the way in which suddenly these, these statues suddenly proliferate. And it almost becomes the, uh, the city into, as a kind of World of Warcraft simulation <laughs> in which these m m figures on horseback march across the, the public space of the city. Uh, Scopy 2013, this is a, a cartoon by an online cartoonist called Extreme BT. Um, all this is kind of copy-paste, and again, this is very much digitally enabled architecture. What do you want to do next? Shift-delete, which is dropped mm. off the end of the screen. <laughs> um, all this is enabled by the fact that um, Macedonia, uh, uh, the Macedonian capital suffered a massive earthquake in 1963, which obliterated much of the public infrastructure of the city. Um, about 1,000 people lost their lives, 150,000 were made homeless, and the city was pretty much razed to the ground. Um, occasioning a huge international relief effort. Uh, UNESCO sponsored an architectural competition to find um, an architect to redesign and replan the city, um, rehouse the inhabitants and provide public infrastructure. And the Japanese architect Kenzo Tange was chosen for the project out of a field of seven serious competitors, four of whom were international, three from Yugos former Yugoslavia. Uh, this was his vision for the city centre and his vision basically was a quite quite realistic and adaptable project, but it bears all the hallmarks of what we like to think of now as socialist architecture, and I'll come to that term in a minute because I think that's quite problematic. Really, uh, Tango could not really be described in any way as, as coming from that tradition. He emerged from the context of Japan, uh, the Second World War, and the rebuilding of Japan after you know, uh, the disaster, that, uh, the, the obliteration of many uh, city centres during the Second World War. Um, so his architectural style is very much a response to, to massive devastation. So he was the right man in the right place at the right time for this particular job. And this is a shot um, of Macedonia, of uh, the Macedonian capital. And you can see the remnants of the architecture uh, put in place after Tange's plan. He didn't, of course, build all this. There's a field of local architects. Many uh, Macedonian architects were involved in the project. Yanko Konstantinov, this is his famous um, post office, which I think was modelled on a, a piece of jewellery which his wife had in her possession. But you see this kind of collision between, it would, here's the brutalism that you introduced me with. Um, it's celebrated as an example, a very well preserved example of brutalist architecture, you know, the whole bet on brute style, raw concrete, that kind of weathering. And um, it held a lot of um, esteem in the architectural world for this, this, kind, of, um, this kind of stuff. Of course, this was in keeping with, we're keeping with the way in which, um, in the former, in what well, I call the former Yugoslavia, but Yugoslavia at the time under Tito, um, the modernist style came to represent a particular um, approach to ethnic identity in the sense that the, the, the dialectic of brotherhood and unity led to the state, the, to the idea that monuments could not have any particular appeal to uh, particular ethnic groups. So that there's, two, there's an opposition there between um, a non specific monumentalization and what's happening now. Uh, this is a quote from um, a contemporary observer. <coughs> but here we're looking at two different things. A photograph of the architecture on the left versus a CGI rendering on the right. And part of my, my project is to throw these things into the same space and see what comes out. Um, this, of course, is a record of past events, and this is a record, um, an anticipation of future events, made to look like past events. And here we see time shuffling back and forth, and a whole set of different dialogues uh, going on. Um, we talk about nation branding, which is a term proposed by Andrew Gran in, in Cultural Anthropology. And he, nation branding is the idea that a nation um, 
solidifies and, and reifies an idea of its own identity in order to present itself to the world community and to attract finance, to appeal to global finance. So nation branding has an economic function. And in the case of Macedonia, this is quite complex. It's complicated by the fact that this project serves a number of different functions. One, it erases the socialist past, or tries to. Two, uh, it sticks its middle finger up at its nearby neighbour in order to declare a national identity which is visible within a local political context. Three, it signifies to the world that the, the nation has an economic power which is to be respected and the past is over and, the, and it's forging forward into a new future. Um, and also, it solidifies that nationalistic, um, very populist uh, core of supporters of the uh, centre-right government who are currently in power. And it also uh, has an ethnic dimension as well, which I won't labour over here, but should be quite obvious. So it serves very many different functions. And I, th I think one of the things you can say about uh, the new digital architecture is that it keys into the image world. And the role of the photograph, the role of the rendering, is very important in addressing all these different discourses. But here you have something which is... Um, functions very much like a portrait of the nation. It reflects itself back to itself, but also it projects outwards an image which is to be responded to in particular ways by particular audiences. So it has all the complexities of the construction of identity and the level of the individual. Um, it's, it's out there in the, in the image world as a city. Or it would have been if the post office hadn't burnt down in January 2013. Uh, I'm not saying anything. It was over the road from the government headquarters, but uh, I'll, I'll, we'll find out. I'm putting these two images together because here we see the, a photograph of Tange's model of, of Skopje next to the digital rendering. And here we see a photograph of a model of a city which is to come into being put next to a rendering of a city which is to come into being. And there are two, again, that opens up another kind of space. Um, we can look at this model and we anticipate that this is something that definitely has not uh, substantially come into to being yet. It's really just uh, there to convince. But the image on the right is something which is substantially in the process of becoming real and, and the, photographic, the photography of it or the photographic ness of it is part of that message. Uh, Tange's architectural um, origins are in a movement called metabolism. Metabolism, of course, is, is uh, a movement which is, um, has its origins in the 1960s. Um, it's very contemporary. If you look at all the things that metabolism says it stands for, there's nothing there which you wouldn't actually um, find unusual within the context of contemporary architecture, networked, interconnected, rationally planned. The idea was that, that it takes the totalizing discourse of the megastructure and says, well, if we're going to plan these technologically uh, enabled megastructures, they need to be adaptable, they need to change. Every 50 years, the community would be able to revivify the city through change. And to some extent, Tange's plan actually anticipates Skopje 20, 2014, because it's almost absorbed and contained within the plan that um, Tange set out. He was never intending for his city to become ossified or set in stone. It's a fluid and connected space that adapts to the needs of its citizens. Yeah. <laughs> so where are we now? The new aesthetic, um, of course. This is the data centre, of course, in Silicon Roundabout. Um, and I was just interested to put these two next to one another. It's great to work from visual similarities. Here is. Um, signs of technological deconstruction in architecture um, and the kind of language of modularization and, and, and pre-construction situated next to this kind of language which now takes the, the building blocks of the city as being digital and they manifest themselves in the form of the, uh, the building itself. This is a more recent uh, construction from 2012 and again this is very, very similar to some of the brutalist structures that we've seen. Um, these kind of massive blocks to play, you know, the play of forms in space. But of course, this is now supposed to be referencing digital culture. This is now something which is a reference to our kind of interconnected state. Um, maybe you, you kind of anticipate where I'm going with this. Um, one of the things that's significant about Skopje after the earthquake, uh, a great deal of um, capital was, was generated, a great deal of state uh, power was generated. Um, the obliteration of the city gave uh, the authorities, the ability to redesign the city and completely, you know, reinvent it. Um, it wasn't pure modernism. It was definitely a signal to the world that here the international style, the metabolist style, was um, was here on the stage to be recognised. It was um, not a naive or, or unselfconscious uh, redevelopment plan. Uh, in terms of projects such as Skopje 2014, 
Um, Andrew Grant writes that what they do in these kind of projects is, again, mobilise a great deal of capital under central control. So there's no really significant difference between what's happening under state socialism with a grand plan to redevelop a city and what's happening under tw uh, Scopia 2014. They're very, very similar in, uh, in aspect. Um, the difference is that the structures under which Scopia 2014 comes into being are rhizomatic, are interconnected, are the, you know, the power base is dispersed, the basis of capital is dispersed, the workforce is dispersed. To some extent, it's a city which is designed by spotty kids in bedrooms with Mac laptops, whereas, as opposed to the great planning departments that would have designed uh, Tanjay's city. Um, so my kind of thesis would be that, you know, this is this is kind of shift that now these kind of totalizing plans are almost as realizable now as they were in the past. Um, there's no real significant difference between, you know, a city in 1965 which is under state ownership of public space, which is, you know, the, the state can just say, we are going to redevelop it, and a city in which um, a centre-right um, ruling party can say we will mobilise capital to, re to redesign our city. Um, and here I think is we're, we're keen to some of those debates about capitalism which were opened up by uh, the Lincoln uh, crew. I, I was quite interested in what they, they came to at the end when they were talking about this dispersion um, of capitalist forces. Um, in terms of statues, there's one other point that I wanted to raise in terms of photography. Uh, looking at the statues and the sculptures that uh, are dotting Scopia's landscape. Um, these are things, again, which have risen, risen really fast. Um, in, con in contemporary professional photographic practice, I, I came across an example not too long ago of a photographer writing about his practice of using raw files versus JPEGs. And he was saying that in the past, what he used to do when he, sh when he went out and shoot was to archive his raw files on his hard disk, a hard disk full of raw files, the digital negative, the something of the, the preservation of stuff in the, in the acquisition of raw files. But what he was finding was that 10 years down the line, these raw files are completely unreadable by any software. And the images that he can access were the low-quality JPEGs, which have constantly been updated and constantly been um, revised and constantly copied and recopied. A certain sense that um, photography has that... Uh, digital photography really makes that quite clear, that uh, in order to be preserved, you have to adapt to, to continually rewrite the data. What the data that's not constantly rewritten and constantly reinterpreted in different formats dies on its feet. Um, <coughs> not, I'm going to skip over that one. Uh, this is a 3D action figure of Guy Debord. I'm throwing that in just for perversity. <laughs> 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 that we, as critical thinkers, uh, statuize our own heroes in our own way. Um, so again, we're looking at this collision between the state of the trace, the trace of the state. Um, <laughs> What I meant to illustrate by that, whether it's clear or not, is that um, I began by looking at causality and kind of reverse causality in relation to images of Bulgarian real estate. I think what Skopje particularly makes very clear is that um, the kind of the, ca the causal chain that underlies the indexical trace, that underlies indexality, no longer has an automatic right to exist. It now has to claim its existence in the same way as a state claims its existence through self-promotion. It's a matter of concern rather than a matter of fact anymore. And to close, the new, uh, in, the, in this kind of accelerated world of digital production, we shouldn't talk about we and us being in this kind of rhizomatic very, very fast architectural condition. It's only to the people who have control of the means of production um, that the digital city is this kind of interconnected space. For the rest of the world, um, these projects are now in a constant state of um, incompletion. And I think that's the real trace that we look for in uh, architectural construction. Okay.